Hello and welcome. This is the ninth meeting of the Connected Learning Community webinar. You can find more about these webinars and other activities of Connected Learning at connectedlearning.tv. Uh, today's guest is Antero Garcia, a doctoral candidate at the University of California, Los Angeles, who has actually just completed his thesis, so congratulations, Antero and an English teacher at Manual Arts High School in South Central Los Angeles. He will join the faculty at Colorado State University this fall as an assistant professor in the English department. And today he's going to talk to us about connected learning in the schools and the classroom. Before uh, Antero gets started, I want to introduce our respondents here. Uh, if you haven't participated in these before, this is really a conversation between our guest and the respondents and if you are following on live stream you can use the text chat there and we will try to get some of your questions from the text chat uh, to Antero and the other guests so um, very briefly um, let's start uh, with Ellen, can you introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Ellen Middaw. I'm research director for the Civic Engagement Research Group at Mills College, um, and our group is affiliated with the Youth and Participatory Politics Research Network, and I uh, study youth civic engagement and civic education. Greg? Sure, um, my name is Greg McVary. I'm an assistant professor at Southern Connecticut State University, and um, I look at specifically how reading and writing is shifting um, with digital text and how what that does to the social practices of literacy. Okay, and Paul. Hi, I'm Paul O. I'm with the National Writing Project, and we are a digital media and learning partner. And uh, I do a lot of work with our teachers who are engaged in digital literacies in the classroom. Okay, so take it away, Antero. Thanks, Howard. Um, so, again, I wanted to really spend uh, the time today having a conversation around the possibilities of connected learning in schools um, and what it can mean for the way it's shaping the, or the way it could shape the teaching profession. Um, so to get there, I want to talk a little bit about where we are now. So I'm going to turn on the screen share um, and hopefully you can, uh, I just want to share this one picture for, for a little bit of context here. Um, and, and what I'm interested in talking through is what does it look like in schools today? So this is a picture of my high school a couple years ago during a six or seven hour lockdown, depending on which classroom you were in, um, where students had to stay in classrooms. Um, they had to use bathroom. The bathroom they had to use was the, the trash can in the back of each classroom. Uh, it's just an overall horrible experience. And uh, the word lockdown comes from um, prison terminology. Um, but I, th I think this really shares the context of who's, whose point of view we're seeing schools from, right? Um, and it's not from the student perspective. It's always a top-down perspective, both figuratively and literally, um, the helicopter looking down on the urban school that I teach at. Um, and then if, you, if, if I broaden this out and think about the context of schooling in Los Angeles today, um, we have RIFs, reduction in force, which is essentially teachers being laid off every year. So one of my best friends, he's been laid off for the past four years, and he's been a substitute for himself this entire year. Right? At the same time, um, if we look nationally, we have the Common Core State Standards, which is this effort to um, create the same standards across every state. Um, we have charter schools coming in. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to sound you know, like the crazy lefty guy talking about the end of the schools as we know them, but I, I do want us to think about how it's not that this is an opportunity to redefine the teaching profession, but it's that this is going to happen regardless of if teachers and researchers are participating or not. This is already kind of the case for uh, what's happening in the world right now. Um, and the people being left out behind this are probably the most important in this effort, and that's the students themselves, right? There's very little opportunity for their voice. And I think, for me, that's where connected learning can come in. There's a space where students can offer opportunities to share their knowledge, to, to shape um, what's happening in, in the world around them, and, and in their schools and in the teaching practices for them. Um, and so I guess that's really what I'm interested in. Um, Ellen's been doing a lot of work um, around the ways uh, civic engagement can, can happen for, for young people through um, digital, um, digital tools. And I, I think I'm really excited to hear from her throughout this. And Paul's work with the National Writing Project, obviously, has been really important to me in terms of thinking about ways this could help teachers kind of develop um, connected learning types of practices. Um, so actually, thanks to both of you for helping kind of chime in throughout. 
Um, but I think as much as there's been a lot of connected learning and interest-driven learning that's happened after schools, it really is those hours from, um, in my context, 7.30 to 3 every day or, or 8, 8 through to 3.30, whatever the school hours are, um, that students are spending most of their time in, right? Uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the 10,000 hours of, of expertise, and I think um, in a student's lifetime in a school, if, if they have at least semi-regular attendance, they're going to easily surpass that 10,000 hours, right? But what are they going to be experts at at the end of the day? Because I think um, that that is a, a question that I'm not quite sure I, I know the answer to um, right now. So in my own research, to, as I was a teacher, as Howard mentioned, I've been I've been doing doctoral work, and my, and my research has been focusing around uh, the possibilities of mobile devices in schools. How can we use um, cell phones in in classrooms and and in school contexts um, to help students learn? And so, what I wanted to do for for a few minutes here before having a larger conversation is share a couple of um, activities I've done with students. Um, and in particular, uh, I think the, the biggest thing I, I want to share is just by putting a phone in the classroom does nothing, right? Because the, the most important valuable part of using a cell phone for learning uh, is the context, right? As soon as this, the, the cell phone for a student, um, the cell phone, sorry, I'm, I'm sharing the wrong slides. Uh, the cell phone for a student is basically a personalized tool, right? It's got um, all of their applications, all of their contacts. It is the way that students communicate with each other. Um, and when we strip the, the device of that meaning and just put it in a classroom, you, you lose all of the different types of purposes for, for why a student would want to use a cell phone to begin with. Um, and so I think the biggest challenge is not to just use a cell phone, um, but to think through what are ways that students can be connected to these types of peer networks in a classroom, right? Where there's already a source of authority as a teacher, right? And balancing those types of traditional school structures that um, you may not necessarily have to deal with in out of school spaces. Um, so one way we started doing that was just looking at the different types of tools that students are using in schools um, or students are using in their everyday practice. And so um, one of my students had the idea of just trying to use Google image search um, to start looking at the stories that are told in aggregate. Um, by being the top images on Google, right? So um, we compared the Google image search for Beverly Hills, um, and then we compared the images for South Central Los Angeles. And just in looking, I know they're probably very small on the on the Hangout here, um, so I would encourage you to actually just Google them <laughs> yourselves. Um, but in just looking at the pit, at the pictures, you can see there's two very different narratives about these spaces, right? And what does that say about representation? Um, in something like Google that people, uh, that students might assume um, is a very apolitical tool. Um, our, my students then um, pushed me and said, well, let's look at jobs, right? So then my students started Google image searching doctor, right? And seeing um, very uh, white male images for the most part of what doctors look like as defined by um, Google in aggregate um, or uh, engineer. And then one student had the bright idea of uh, Google image searching nurse, and that was very embarrassing for me because I wasn't prepared for the image on sexual representation with the word nurse. So teachers out there, um, a word of caution uh, if, if that's what you're going to be doing. Um, but, but what this did was it really gave us an opportunity to look at how these devices, um, these, these tools that, that uh, we use in our, in our everyday life, really help shape the stories that are being told about us without a whole lot of agency from my students during that time. right? And I'm interested in those types of literacy practices and how those are pushing us forward. Um, I think a couple other examples I'm just going to share quickly, um, and this is something I wrote up for Digital Is, um, was work around Romeo and Juliet. Um, so as a ninth grade English teacher, Romeo and Juliet is, is definitely a, a text that um, I, like many teachers, have, have taught. Um, and instead of just looking at the canonical versions, the 1968 Zeffirelli version of Romeo and Juliet, 1996 Baz Luhrmann version of Romeo and Juliet, also known as the Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio version for my students, um, we went to YouTube. And if you look on YouTube, you predominantly get these middle class white images that depict what it means to be gangster or ghetto um, as they reenact scenes of Romeo and Juliet. And my students thought these were the funniest things in the world because it's these kids who are who pretend they're acting gangster or ghetto and they're completely um, off base in terms of um, fact, factual truths about their community or about what it means to be gangster. 
Um, I, I'm holding up uh, quotation mark fingers when, when I say these words. You just can't see them. You're going to have to take my word for it. Um, but these images, um, as funny as they were at first, became very troubling for, for my students. Um, after a while, they felt like they were being mocked. Um, and they felt um, like other people were defining what it means to live in South Central Los Angeles. And so the real challenge here for my students was to think through Romeo and Juliet has become, in terms of literacy practices, is more than just this text from over 500 years ago. It's, it's, it's now this text that extends online and creates a very uh, articulate truth about what it means to live in the ghetto if you've never been there before, right? This defines what the community is for my students, even if you've never been there, right? And it's defined in stereotypes, um, and it's defined in ways that inflate truths that are very difficult for my students. At the other end of the, the spectrum is if you if you Google or if, if you type into YouTube the name of my school, it's going to auto suggest that what you're looking for are school fights because that's the other thing that's commonly uploaded about uh, the school I teach at. Um, and so there's two things that are coming out of YouTube here, right? One are these stereotypes about my community, and two is um, like in Google Image Search, it's pulling up um, very popular aggregate um, videos of. Uh, fights that happen at my school that also kind of reinforce these types of stereotypes. And so there's some real challenges here, and I'm interested in the ways these types of participatory learning tools can be used for things that are commonly taught for standards, right, like Romeo and Juliet. Um, the other type of example I want to I share very briefly before I move on in a sec, before I have a, a better conversation here, um, so I want to I talk a little bit about um, gameplay. Um, and so a couple of the projects I've been doing in my classroom have been around alternate reality games. And if, if that's not a familiar term for you, an alternate reality game is basically when you layer a fiction um, on top of the everyday world that you pretend is happening. Right? So uh, in 2008, working with Greg Niemeyer at UC Berkeley, uh, we created the Black Cloud game in my 12th grade English classroom. Um, the Black Cloud game's premise is that there's a cloud of pollution um, that is so big that it has developed consciousness and has now decided to communicate with my students uh, via Twitter and via these boxes that you see on the screen. Um, this box is something we call the Pufftron box because it's it's like a cloud, it's puffy. Um, and all of those lights um, that make up the cloud's eyes um, are sensors that are measuring air quality. They're measuring light, sound, temperature, uh, carbon dioxide, and volatile organic compounds, which is why we're holding up the, the pen and the the red lights on it will, will shoot up um, if this was a video. And so what we did was we tried to give students empowered identities, right? I think this is one of the ways to think through pedagogically what these games and what these tools can mean for in terms of connected learning in classrooms. Um, we tried to, we called the students during the time that we played this game for about two months, uh, we called them citizen scientists, right? And even though they're still technically English students and they're in Mr. Garcia's English class, um, this was a time when they were going out, they were collecting data, they were finding these sensors in and around their neighborhood. So we took a field trip and walked down to the dry cleaners where we'd hidden one of these sensors weeks before and had been collecting data. Um, and from there, it was really about students collecting this data and then being able to act, feeling empowered enough to have data to act upon it, right? Um, looking at how can we improve the air quality? Because one of the things we found was that the most polluted space at our, um, in our community was my classroom because you've got 40 bodies in a room with a closed door early in the morning. You're developing lots of carbon dioxide and it's making people feel ill and sick, right? Which is why people will say they're sick of school. They're just sick of their environment, possibly, right? I say that with a, uh, yeah. So um, again, there, there's a lot of technology behind this. We had, you know, we had an online website that helped us track the data and look for patterns across it. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really about getting students to act upon and make real world changes in their world, right? It's less about the ways these tools can be used for the sake of using cool devices, right? If you just use a phone in a classroom, that doesn't do a whole lot, right? Um, what does do a whole lot is when you get students to feel empowered to make changes in and around their spaces through curriculum, right? This was still an English class, right? It was still aligned to the California content state standards. Um, and then just the, the last game I want to talk about, they've been um, sick of talking about lately because it's been for my dissertation um, is the is something I called Ask Anansi um, and I want to make clear I'm saying Anansi not a Nazi um, so Anansi is the West African folk folklore hero uh, he's a trickster he's a spider um, and in one of the stories Anansi has gotten all of the stories from I think Lion he's, he's tricked Lion and has taken all of the stories 
And so the idea with Ask Anansi is that students can ask him a question using um, their iPods, their phones in, in this study. Um, and the, a question that a student asked is, Nancy, can you tell us the story of the absence of love in South Central Los Angeles? I think it's a really beautifully phrased question um, that one of my students came up with. Um, and instead of simply saying, well, here's the story, this is why there's an absence of love, um, Anansi says, well, can you take a picture? Or can you do an interview for me and, and tell me the story that you've gotten? And in doing that, it, it creates several iterations of critical research that students have taken upon themselves. Um, we then did a scavenger hunt based around sites that students were interested in. Um, and so if a student was interested in issues of space and equity at the school space, they, we used those black spider rings that you find at, um, during Halloween. This is a very expensive venture, as you can tell, um, and some dental floss to hang it in the, in the doorway. And that led students um, to this discarded classroom where students were able to start questioning, you know, what's happening with school spaces on campus. Um, Altogether, this model is something that with Greg Niemeyer, I've helped develop this phrase, inform, perform, transform, in terms of a model of using connected learning and gameplay uh, in classrooms. And so inform, perform, transform, obviously there's three stages. And the first is we get information for ourselves. We inform ourselves as, as students. Um, so in this, Anansi asks us to go out, get more information, we bring it back. Um, he asks us to revise our claims, we go back and get more information, conduct more research. We've informed ourselves. Next step, we perform this information by sending each other on these scavenger hunts in, in this Ask Anansi example. Um, we sent the 17 other students in the class, went around and investigated these spaces, looked at them, questioned them, but we had a closed game for only 17 students. So we finally ended with transform, where we take this closed game and try to open it up publicly. Um, it's hard to see on this picture, but we put um, like museum-like placards next to all of the different sites that we we're in. So as other students and other community members walked around our neighborhood, they would encounter these cards that would ask them to question the spaces around them, would get a counter narrative for the purpose of schooling and the structures around it, um, and really gives an opportunity to move beyond a closed game and, and moving into the social world that is usually connected to mobile devices. Um, and so this, these are a couple of ways that I've been thinking about this. I think there's some real challenges. Um, and I just want to note before I, I open this up to, to everybody, um, that in terms of scalability, this is kind of the next step, and, and this is um, my plea to uh, the connected learning community is that um, I need help with this. Um, with a group of other teachers in South Central Los Angeles, um, we're opening up a new public high school um, starting in August, actually, and it's called the Critical Design and Gaming School, CDAGS. Um, and it's based primarily on principles of gameplay, and we're bringing in uh, video game design. It's a public high school run um, in Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, and the biggest challenge for me, this is, this is the question I have for everybody, um, is how do we do this with, with teachers who aren't necessarily oriented towards these practices? We're going to be getting teachers um, who are not brand new. Um, we're getting senior teachers who are being placed in this school based on seniority um, and may not necessarily be interested in connected learning types of practices. So in terms of professional development, in terms of engagement with students, what are the ways that we're going to be working with these people um, these people, so that sounds very pejorative, with these other teachers um, to help transform the lives of students. Um, and so I think from there, that's, that's really the question and, and where I'm hoping this conversation can go is bringing in other teachers and scaling this work up. Um, so I think I'll stop ranting now. Okay, so um, respondents, who wants to jump in? Who's got a question, a uh, comment, wants to extend what Antero has said? Well, I, I'll jump in really quickly just to say that at one point Antero mentioned Digital Is, and um, I wanted to point out that Digital Is is a national writing project site uh, in which teachers like Antero have engaged in inquiry into their practices with regard to digital media and literacy. And in looking at the Digital Is website, um, you know, I, I've I've been fortunate to work with a number of teachers who are who are at this point of really examining these questions of participatory learning, participatory culture, connected learning um, in ways that, uh, you know, perhaps were not um, totally articulated under the, you know, under the principles of connected learning. But I would say, you know, there are many examples at the site, you know, that came to mind as Antara was talking. And I just wanted to point out one that I think is really fascinating. Um, there's a teacher in um, Charlotte, um, she's actually in, in graduate school now, Lacey Manship, who 
worked with their kindergartners. Um, and so this is going back to what you were talking about, Antero, with regard to a device and whether devices are, um, uh, you know, or, or the degree to which devices are socially situated and the fact that they're not neutral. And so she made, you know, what seems like a simple decision, but was really a radical decision, which was simply to give her um, first graders, actually, I'm not sure if I said kindergartners, but her first graders, she, she put a video camera, a flip cam into their hands and really just let them shoot and then begin to reflect upon, you know, the video that they captured. And um, if you go to the Digital's website and check out this resource by Lacey, you'll see that there are these, you know, four second clips that um, look like something that, you know, perhaps I would take if I like butt sat on my camera and shot, you know, video. Um, but what was really fascinating was the, the conversation that then this engendered. And in her, in her um, thinking about this process, uh, Lacey really began to talk about the degree to which, you know, students have authority, students have the ability to um, have some sense of agency with regard to the devices that they're using. And um, in the end, uh, the, the, the fact that the students were, were really just um, simply the ones who were in charge of videotaping and making decisions about what they videotaped led to all kinds of interesting conversations like about you know, critical media literacy, for instance. Um, you know, what, what the students began to notice was the fact that um, you know, when they, or what Lacey began to notice and then you know, had conversations with the students about was the fact that when students began um, becoming more comfortable with the video camera, they then began taking their, um, you know, the, the things that the, 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 the kinds of um, practices that they saw on TV, for instance, like newscasters, and they began replicating them, that in the classroom, which then led to conversations about, you know, so why is that? And why do you think, or, you know, like they began talking like people on infomercials that they happen to see on TV. So why do people talk like that? You know, what is the message that they're trying to convey? And um, in the end, you know, this this device, which you know really could be thought of as neutral, um, you know, held a lot of power in terms of who actually was behind the device, who had control of the device, and then you know what was being done with the the digital artifacts and how they were understood and, and talked about. And I'll just say one last thing about this. You know, that I thought was so amazing is that. It was less this sort of structured activity of, you know, I'm going to work with my kids to create a digital story, which, you know, I think has, has its um, benefits for sure, um, you know, and, and there are pedagogical reasons why you'd want to engage in that. But this really was um, an opportunity t for Lacey, and you can see this in the resource of digital is, to situate herself as well as a learner, as someone who's inquiring next to her first graders, you know, what happens when you do X? And in this case, it was, you know, Give, give all of us the opportunity to have control over this video camera. So, um, yeah, so that was just one story that came to mind that I feel like, you know, is among many that could be surfaced that digital is um, really written by a whole network of teachers. Um, can I chime in here? So, uh, building off of Ontario's last question and a little bit of what Paul was saying, what I was trying to think of is you were asking Ontario, how can you, um, uh, introduce teachers who may or may not be familiar with this approach to learning. Um, and what I wanted to point out was sort of thinking about what's new and and maybe what's less new. So one of the reasons that I'm drawn to sort of thinking about participatory culture and connected learning is because in many ways the principles align with the sort of um, constructivist and cri critical pedagogical practices that a lot of good civic education believes in. So um, you were talking about the top-down view of schooling and um, and I think a lot of civic education really tries to disrupt that sort of hierarchy and think about how can you change the power dynamic between students and teachers so that students have sort of authentic opportunities to make decisions and to define um, their identity relative to a community. Um, and chances to sort of practice what it means to be civically engaged. And so a lot of those practices have been articulated for teachers. And then the question is, uh, the thing many of them aren't familiar with is the technology aspect. So the question is sort of how do you articulate 
what you're doing in language of what they're already trying to accomplish and then have you demonstrate what is the technology or the game or what's different, what's new with the sort of game design approach. And so how does that reinforce and how does it slightly change what they're doing? Um, and one question I guess I had listening to your work on Tarot was, um, it was really interesting to me to see, because I'm always trying to think, okay, what does the technology actually do? Uh, what's the role of technology in this? And then how much of it is the kind of practice that is constructivist practice or critical pedagogy, which are different but related. Um, and so one of the things I was just noticing was with the ghetto Shakespeare version is you were really putting youth in conversation with other communities and you can do that sort of project with um, you know just media literacy and magazine but you don't put people in the sort of conversation with the other youth who are creating um, those videos and so I just had a question um, how much did using mobile or using technology in your work um, support the sort of community building of youth in your classroom like how much were they feeling like how did you see that playing a role for building community in your classroom or their sense of identity of their school or was it more around a critical sort of challenging? Yeah, I'm, so I'm really glad you asked that because when I, so when I started doing that study, I, I, my assumption was the role of technology was going to be huge, that it was going to be all about using cell phones and because I use cell phones, you know, magic doors would, uh, would open up or something. And that, that, that's not the case because again, it's, it's the context, right? As soon as I told my students that we're using cell phones in the classroom, they were excited but they also recognized the context has shifted, right? They're, this this person of authority is telling them to take out their iPod or their phone, right? And it's really changed what a cell phone means um, in that case. Um, I do think for, in terms, I agree with you that, you know, there's a dialogue that cannot happen through technology, but I think what connected learning and, and participatory learning can mean um, is an engagement regardless of technology, right? Um, I know that the young boy, Kane from Kane's Arcade, that's kind of gone viral in the past month, I think, um, when, when I had the opportunity to meet him back in October at a conference, um, he, I, if you don't know who I'm talking about, sorry, I realized I might sound like a crazy person right now. Um, he's basically uh, a, a young boy who's created um, a, a full arcade system only out of cardboard boxes, and he replicates um, digital practices. So he will, um, if you win at skee ball, he, he climbs underneath the table and feeds tickets through the box as if he's a machine. Um, and it, there's nothing. Um, electronic about it except for a handheld calculator that he uses to verify codes. Um, but I think those types of practices really speak to the ways that our culture has shifted from one of consumption to production. Um, and, and I think that cultural change is what I'm trying to instill in my classroom. So even if we didn't have phones and ha you know half the time our internet's down at our school anyways, um, I think the opportunity is to be more student-centered, right? And so um, a lot of what I've been writing lately has been trying to think through, you know, what does critical pedagogy look like for a digital age, right? What is a wireless critical pedagogy? Because um, I think you're right that um, a lot of the critical pedagogy literature, um, obviously it comes from um, Brazilian educator um, Paulo Freire um, from the 60s and 70s, um, and he came, from a, he came from a very different context, working with adults in a rural, um, in a rural area um, that is not America, in the context of, of teaching that we're day. Um, and I think at this point, like, we really need to revitalize what, um, what a pedagogy of participatory learning looks like. And so I don't think it means students have to have their phones on. And I don't think it means um, that we have to, you know, necessarily have um, 800 smart boards and iPads and one-to-one -one laptops for everyone. I think those are all great. Um, I just don't necessarily think they do anything to improve pedagogy, right? So I definitely appreciate kind of where your question is coming from, Mel, and I'm curious what I guess others have to say too. I see Paul's rejoined us. He didn't like that question or something. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, um, I want to hop in here and kind of bring up together what Paul was saying, um, and back to Antero's example of the CDAG school, because what I loved about Paul's response with the kindergarten classrooms is that idea that agency is a hugely developmental process um, for some students, and I think more so it's it's really it's a development of opportunity and I think a lot of our of our students who you know by just error of zip code don't come to school empowered with that um, same sense of agency as some of their better off peers so when I look at what we're doing in at that grade level with what you're doing at CDAGs and what they're doing in the kindergarten what it, it makes me really want to rethink this idea that um, a that 
metacognitions and self, like a cognitive one-on-one -on -one skill. I, I really, I, I like to look, oh, sorry. I like to look, I got kicked out of my office today. I like to look more at, um, at the idea of, you know, metacognition as strategy exchange. And I think that Antero was talking about a lot with, the, with not needing the cell phones is we're really not trying to, when you're teaching, you know, the sense of, in a participatory connected learning style, there isn't just some group that you can just, some taxonomy of skill you can hand off. But it's this idea that you have to watch these strategies unfold and they're, they're handed out in a very kind of collaborative, um, participatory nature. And that's, I think, it truly gets at, at my sense of how I define learning. So I just wanted to make that point and try to answer the question that way, if it made any sense at all. Yeah, and if I can jump in and just say that I think that makes a lot of sense, and I, I feel like one of the things that seems to be true uh, to, to many of the teachers in our network in the National Writing Project, and, uh, you know, I'd be interested to hear your take on this, Antero, as someone who is part of the UCLA, um, you know, a member of the UCLA Writing Project, is that the, you know, the, that, that change really um, needs to, um, needs to be, uh, generated um, from the ground up um, in many respects. And so when you were talking, I mean, I just caught the tail end of this, but when you were talking about, you know, like the distribution of iPads, you know, 25,000 iPads, I think I read recently in the San Diego public schools, which, you know, may or may not have a positive impact on, you know, students' agency and participatory learning in school. But I think what we in the writing project have practiced for a long time with regard to writing and composing. And then I would say that, you know, we're kind of greedy. We believe that, you know, all forms of uh, digital, maybe not all, but many and most forms of digital interaction really fall under this umbrella or this, um, you know, yeah, this umbrella of, of writing, of composing. You know, we have really believed in generating communities of practice to, to foster and foment change. And I think one example of this recently, um, in fact, Ellen and I were just on a call yesterday. You know, we're engaged in a, in a project. So this is just one example. And this, this is one that's mediated by, you know, a grant that we've been able to apply for. But, um, you know, we're engaged in a project in the Oakland Public Schools in which uh, the focus is on civic engagement. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love for Ellen to talk more about that. But I would just say that you know, one aspect of this with regard to the high school teachers um, who we'll be working with, who I'll be working with, and I, I feel really fortunate, is, is really coming together as a community of learners and inquirers and less a, you know, these are the tools that you have to use. These are the devices that, you know, you need to learn to use. But, but really also building upon what Ellen said earlier, um, really thinking about, you know, what, what are their practices now? Um, you know, what, what are you as a teacher engaging in? Um, what are the ways in which, um, you know, uh, learning happens today and um, learning in school and out of school for students? And how can we find uh, really the commonality there um, and, and figure out ways in which, uh, you know, we can implement um, either practices or tools, you know, in combination with practices that would support civic engagement and civic education um, uh, in which that is the primary focus and the technology, the, the, the digital media literacy skills, um, you know, uh, support that um, goal of civic engagement. But yeah, I would, I would love it if Ellen would be yeah. more about this. Um, so one of the things that during our planning process, we asked a group of teachers to come together and think about, okay, you know, what would it look like to prepare students in Oakland Unified School District in that particular context to be informed, effective civic actors? Um, and so we spent a lot of time on sort of the definition of what is civic engagement and what can you do to promote it. Um, and um, I think the turning point in that process was hearing from students who had done these really powerful senior projects where they had addressed community problems. And what struck me from that was what the students shared was uh, so much of what they shared spoke for the need for the kinds of practices you're talking about. They talked about need to really explore and define for themselves, you know, what what their identity was, what their what issues mattered to them. So what they cared about in ninth grade wasn't what they cared about in twelfth grade. 
Um, and that didn't change just because they aged, but because they had spent some time sort of investigating what does it mean to work on this problem um, and working with other students and sharing their feedback. Um, the other piece was access to mentors and a sort of iterative, you know, they needed time in a community setting to practice what does it uh, look like to sort of explain your point of view, to ask questions, to research, and then to ask somebody, can you help me, you know, does this make sense or can you help me narrow this down? Um, and then the other piece is they all said, you know, they had a really hard time sort of like that some of the things we take for granted that they know how to do, um, find information, um, create effective products, that kind of thing. Um, on the internet, they were saying, I actually need help with this in this setting. You know, I can find information about these other things I care about, but figuring out how to find out information and narrow it down on, um, on you know, uh, food deserts or that kind of thing is something that I actually needed to practice. Um, and I think that really sort of drove it home to the teachers, you know, because they did really impressive work. And so to see that really impressive work and to hear from them, it took this approach to learning for me to do this really impressive work, I think really opened that up. And so it became very obvious sort of why um, digital literacy support was needed, why um, students needed opportunities to practice in a sort of community setting, starting in ninth grade became obvious. So that's, that's a bit about, Paul, do you wanna add anything to? Uh, no, I think that's great, uh, so thanks. Um, I'll hop in there because uh, you kind of stumbled onto this idea that, you know, the, the students do need that support when we give them the internet to read and write, um, that being where I do a lot of my work. And especially, you know, even when we've done studies where we control for their offline reading ability for, you know, their socioeconomic status, there's a huge um, gap between um, our students in the more affluent school districts and those that aren't. Um, and that, that skill difference, um, I think, is going to be critical because what we're, we're seeing is quantitatively um, students of, of minority backgrounds spend have more screen time in, in our latest Pew studies. But the qualitative screen time isn't there. And when I work with middle school students on watching them, you know, conduct research online or to write online or to even engage in academic discourse or any discourse for that matter online, um, the kind of arguments and, and the foundations aren't there. And going back to where Antero was talking about the Common Core, I think that was a huge oversight that the word internet really only shows up in the writing standards. Um, and they don't specifically focus in, well, you know, they, they implicitly apply technology spread throughout, but there is no real explicit mention in standards of how the realm of reading is shifted as, as we move online. Um, and we've all seen it, you know, they're looking for that one source, and it's like, oh, this is all the information I'm looking for, this is good, I'm ready to go. Um, and I know, you know, our, our, we have a moderator who's been working this field forever, so he probably knows, you know, a lot there, but yeah, it's, it's a critical issue. I, I want to just jump on that, and since you've, you've brought up the Common Core, um, I, I do want to bring up some of the other limitations because there's only a very number of them. Um, being sarcastic here, sorry, sarcasm doesn't work well on the internet, I don't think. Um, but I think, I think one of the other things that I feel really frustrated with the Common Core is yes, I, I don't think I think it's a very um, monolithic view of um, ways technology are integrated into learning, but I also think it's taken a step back from some of the things that do work in schools. And particularly as an English teacher, um, it's stripped away the kind of meaningful context of literature um, that uh, for me have been probably the most effective tools um, in working with young people and in helping them shape civic identity, right? So um, classic canonical texts have been the places where I've gotten kids to find passion in an English classroom, right? These are very traditional. There's nothing very digital about these other than maybe ways you can structure pedagogy around them. But I think there's something to be said for getting kids to be reading books um, that is very intimately tied to connected learning, but probably not in ways that are going to be happening in after school spaces and aren't going to necessarily be reinforced, reinforced by the common core. Um, and so I, I think this is a bit of an aside, but I do want to kind of make a, a plea out there for the kinds of traditional um, texts being used in classrooms, um, but use them in very atraditional ways, right? Like let's blow up. Um, Romeo and Juliet in, in that example, right? Or The Great Gatsby. You know, I, I think I think there's something to be said for the canon. Um, 
and I, I can imagine there are some people who would jump on my back for, for saying those types of things, but I think there's something that's really important in terms of what literature means for young people in shaping the identity and the ways that they would engage civically. Um, and thinking through that, um, a lot of my research has been, um, uh, something that's really uh, had an impact on it um, is the work that Ellen's kind of led up around um, um, digital activism and, and service learning. I was hoping, Ellen, you might be able to talk a little bit about the framework you helped develop there. I know some of it's for out-of-school context, but I think it's, it's been really useful for me to think through. You might be muted if you're, if you're talking. Sorry. No, thank you. I was muted. Um, so uh, what we did was brought together um, with funding from Haystack, thank you, um, some scholars in service learning and youth-led organizing and digital media and learning. And so the idea, as I mentioned, one of the reasons I've been drawn to participatory culture and connected learning is because I feel like it aligns well with these principles of civic education um, or the approaches. And we really wanted to bring in people who do sort of service learning in school, which connects youth to community, but also youth organizers, because that tends to reach um, a group of youth who may not be well affiliated with school. Um, and it just takes sort of a different, more activist approach. Um, and so what we really did was try to identify, right, what are these um, approaches to learning trying to what, what are they trying to, what opportunities are they trying to provide youth? And then how can digital media either sort of reinforce, extend, transform? I mean, that's where I've been taking it. That's not where we were a year ago, um, uh, these practices. And so what we identified was, you know, each of these approaches, they operate in really different spheres and settings, but um, they really try to connect youth to sort of the, to community and the culture of movement. So the idea of building this sense of connection to something larger than yourself, um, because you need that kind of context to really think both about what the public means to you, but also to make collective action possible. There's no collective, and much of civic engagement, even if it's individual, it's because you know you're connecting to a collective action. Um, the other piece was the idea that youth need opportunities to, they. They have the right and they need opportunities to be civic actors. Um, so they are both citizens in our country and have a right to participate, but also um, you don't magically become able to when you're 18 and are granted the right to vote. So they need opportunities to, um, to promote their voice. Um, the third was really that um, they need sort of authentic learning opportunities so that you don't learn civic engagement by hearing a set of facts, you need opportunities to work with other people to define problems, to think about different solutions, to research them, to test out. Um, and so that just implies a need for a connected learning approach. Um, and then the last part is really about having opportunities to grapple with issues of justice and fairness. So um, public life inevitably requires um, choices and trade-offs and thinking about competing needs and so that inevitably requires thinking about issues of justice and fairness so people you need opportunities to define for themselves and so we just really worked through and thought about okay how does integrating digital media into the context support so service learning and youth organizing have been working I would say since the 30s, <laughs> if not longer, trying to create these opportunities in and out of school to do these things. And so the question was, you know, what's sort of different? Um, how can technology reinforce this? But also, what about participatory culture, this culture shift that Ontario was talking about? Are there sort of new opportunities or challenges that we need to think about? Um, and I don't want to take up all the airtime here, so I don't know, <laughs> Ontario, if you want me to keep going or sort of no, I, mean, I think that. I, I think that's super helpful I just think I mean I think the same types of frameworks for civic engagement um, are the types of practices for for young people as well right mm -hmm. um, that can be happening in schools and I, I would just add because I think you've really helped me think through that probably the biggest limitation of, of this conversation today is the fact that it's one that's absent of the young people who are who are at question here right that they would right. probably have a lot to say in the space um, as would a lot of teachers, and we, we have scheduled this in a time that would make it very difficult for either of those two groups to, to be present here. So I just want to you know, right. recognize that they're, they're, we're speaking about a group and not necessarily with that group today. So right. I'm just going to throw that out there. 
I wanted to jump in here very quickly with a, a, a question from the uh, the live stream. This is something that comes up often in our, our connected learning discussions, which is can, can you make some bridges between the really exciting kinds of activities you're talking about and the current conceptions and enactments of traditional uh, academic subjects, the curriculum? Yeah, definitely. So. I mean, I do want to. I want to say, like, all of the examples that I've been sharing happened in a traditional. I can. I think you can see the quotation fingers this time. That's good. The traditional English classroom, right? Um, it wasn't like we taught Romeo and Juliet and then we did the crazy YouTube stuff. These two things were tied together. It wasn't that we worked on, you know, doing research papers and then we went out and, and measured the environment and did crazy stuff talking to a cloud. Um, it's that these two things happen in tandem, and I think that. Um, what traditional means needs to change, right? It's only traditional because it's what most people have done traditionally, right? Um, and it's only new because there's only a couple of crazy teachers down the hall who are doing that new stuff. Mm -hmm. But if we make that the traditional practice, then I think that I think that's where the bridge is. Is that um, the bridge is that they're one and the same, right? For in, in a participatory classroom, um, the types of participatory learning should be tied to the curriculum, um, which is probably tied to stuff around teacher evaluation that makes me frankly uncomfortable, these two things should be tied together in terms of how students are learning and what they're learning at the same time. Um, and it's really a matter of the types of work that, that Paul's talked about, developing communities of practice to pull these groups together, right? Um, part of what I love so much about the National Writing Project and my experience with it is it's teachers who are passionate about what they're doing, right? They come together and um, Parts of the days they may be writing stuff that's not at all about their students, right? And it's it's about writing for the sake of writing. It's something that um, they instill a love in, right? It's it's people coming together because of this passion. And I think you then see that passion tied into their practice. Um, and I, to me, I think that's really important. I'm curious, maybe if other people have thoughts on on that bridging question that Howard's brought up. Sure, I, I'll, I'll jump in, I, I, and let me just say right off the bat that I'm pretty sure that what I'm about to say is not going to make sense because <laughs> I'm formulating it um, as in reaction to a lot of the conversation. Um, but just so so one piece of this is you know I, I do think that this is really the you know critical challenge. Um, how do we implement some of these practices in classrooms more widely? You know, given all the um, you know, the, the other kinds of pressures um, and challenges, um, you know, particularly the, you know, the mandates as we've all talked about. Um, I, I do know that one thing that is true, I'll come back to digital is again as a repository that I think is true about that space is that it is a documentation of practice that, that um, you know, K-12 practitioners in all kinds of school settings are engaging in, um, you know, so not only is there your piece on tarot that you described um, about Romeo and Juliet and the ghetto, but, um, you know, another teacher, a high school teacher, Danielle Filipiak um, from Detroit, worked on developing a piece in which her students um, started with poetry um, as, a, as a digital artifact, a movie that they put up on uh, Vimeo, and then launched into um, that, you know, sort of expression of their community. It's called I Love My City, and it's um, situated in Detroit. Um, that then led to, you know, an examination of like what they could do, um, you know, to make change in their city as, you know, community activists. Um, and, you know, and that is, uh, you know, she, she was not in a, a, an unusual setting, I would say, you know, in her school environment. Um, but, you know, so that's possible. That said, I think what, what we've seen, and this is the part that, you know, I'm just now articulating. Um, I've been thinking a lot about um, streams lately. And by that, I don't mean like the kind with water. I mean like, uh, you know, Facebook streams. And I feel like what's interesting is it's a way for us to essentially collaborate in this, you know, sort of one um, moment with a lot of different people. And I think what Ellen was talking about, you know, with regard to students um, being able to collaborate and see themselves as connected to others um, which, you know, is a huge principle in co connected learning is also really critical, um, not just for teachers, but I think for organizations too. And I think that that's what's been powerful here. I think, um, you know, with the, with the connected learning webinars, for instance, um, and I guess my question perhaps that, you know, I wanted to articulate is how do we, um, because I think, so let me just pull back for a second and say that you know, a lot of our teachers, I think, have really benefited, you know, writing project teachers have benefited from our exposure, you know, to this work um, as an organization. And so it just makes me recognize that in some ways, you know, 
how do we pull together those organizations that in some ways, you know, could act um, civically in, in response and in reaction to the, the, the kinds of, um, you know, uh, political structures, I think, that are creating um, the, the kinds of climates and environments in schools that make it challenging, you know, for teachers to engage in this work. Um, and I believe this is, you know, this is one opportunity, but it seems to me like we need to create, so coming back to the stream, you know, we, we need to create this stream of opportunities in a way, you know, from, from, from all engaged um, and interested actors, you know, how do we do that? I mean, it seems like a huge um, question in a way, but, but I think that that may be, you know, one method towards, um, towards, you know, beginning to institute change. Uh, I guess maybe I'm a little bit more skeptical. Um, I think that the students who need this kind of agency and connected learning activities are the ones that, that need it the most, are the ones that are going to get it the le less, because they're going to be under pressure um, to, to raise those mandates. And I, but I do see a possible solution with the kind of, of mobile devices, um, bringing back your mobile devices and Paul's concept of streams, because that stream creates a data trail. Um, and I think we have to get used to looking for growth, not in the final product but in that stream that students to develop. So we have to look for growth, say for example, if you're just looking at how well students um, formulate an argument. Um, looking at how that, that, their ability to formulate an argument instead of that final paper or that final you know, video that they hand in, we have to be willing to look at that growth over time. Um, and that's why I think we, you know, we're seeing ever since that study about the automated, you know, scoring, which correlates well with how well humans score, this huge fear that, oh my gosh, robots are taking over the world. I don't, I think we need to be a little bit more open to the concept that there's a huge stream of data that's being created. And we can, over time, hopefully parse that and look for student growth that way so that our students who do need this connected learning, civic engagement agency the most, won't be left out and just focusing in on, you know what, which onset goes with this rhyme and that's all you're going to do in the next month and a half. Um, and so that's that's where I would try to use the stream um, and the mobile devices to kind of get at that kind of, I hate to say the word analytics, but, you know, let's tap that data. I think the, I think the students who need it the most, it's more of a matter of, um, I think this comes back to the participation gap that um, Henry Jenkins has talked about, right? That um, some students are able to do informal connected learning. They have the types of opportunities that um, happen after school. Um, whereas a lot of my students, uh, particularly the 11th and 12th graders, work one or two jobs after school every night, right? Um, they don't have computers at home. And if they do have computers, many of them do not have internet access at home. And I think, you know, if we don't provide those opportunities in schools, right, I think this really speaks to who, how do we, you know, address issues of equity across, across different um, school contexts. Um, I also, I'm curious in terms of thinking about how writing practices look different, right? Again, I'm an English teacher, so writing and, and reading are, are important to me. Um, but a very fundamental one that may seem mundane is I think the physical process of writing looks different um, for young people today, right? And so in schools, writing looks like this, right? It's the pen on the paper. It's a one-handed um, it's a one-handed activity, um, whereas I think for young people when they're producing texts online, it's a two-handed endeavor that's thumbed, which may seem kind of like not a big, I guess it looks like a video came too. It may not seem, you know, like a big change, but physically like students are, are, in, are think through different types of writing in different ways, right? And how do we facilitate that type of work, right? For me, writing is a two-handed most fingered activity, right? Versus I'm, I'm very awful with my thumbs and I'm not, I'm not very good. Um, on the phone. And I think as teachers we need to think through those types of contexts, right, of, of what it means to be writing um, in this age. You know, things like that I think haven't really been pushed forward as much as just the expectations that students are going to do it online or they're going to do it this way or that way. Um, I just wanted to reinforce, I guess, the, the equity issue because I think we really do want to draw attention to what are we preparing students to do and what model of learning are we giving them and are we giving all students the kind of model of learning that will serve them to be sort of agentic thought leaders in, you know, in the modern age and so the idea that, you know, this is, this approach to learning is a sort of, it's an equity issue and so, um, the people who are sort of in leadership and management positions are not just doing what they're told or learning to do rote um, work or 
um, doing it without technology for that matter. Um, and then just anecdotally, I wanted to share, I'm sure you've encountered this with your students, but in some of our interviews with students where I was just thinking of the thumbs and how many students have told us they write entire papers for class on their mobile devices because they don't have access to printers at home or reliable internet. And so just to reinforce the idea of there is a sort of change in practice and what does it mean to write a whole paper on a tiny screen with your thumbs, uh, which just gives me a headache thinking about but. <laughs> You know, that, that seems to me an entrepreneurial um, opportunity there. That uh, So wh what do they do? They write um, 400 SMSs to, to themselves? Um, maybe there's an app for people who that's the way they write, that they can, they can send these SMSs to a, a URL and it turns it into a pap paper they can turn in. I mean, I don't know, just a wild idea that came up there. Tweet paper. <laughs> Howard, do you want to talk a little bit, maybe about, um, maybe talk about the the NetSmart um, course that we've talked a little bit about and possibilities in in uh, high school classrooms? Maybe. Okay, you know, I just uh, thank you, thank you for that. I just wanted to jump on that, and and I I can see that you are pretty busy with your your thesis and teaching high school students and getting ready to to move to Colorado. But I, I would love to to. Um, to recruit you and any other high school teacher who's paying attention out there. So I, I created a syllabus around social media literacies that, that uses uh, my recent book, Net Smart, but also many other resources that I was able to find to teach social media literacies. And this is, uh, you know, this is sort of um, circular here in that I really started thinking about writing that book because I didn't feel that the literacies that were important and essential and and not really that difficult weren't being weren't being taught you know from from attention um, to participation and, and and collaboration so having finished the book um, one of the things that had been on my mind from the beginning was to make a syllabus of it and so I teach college students I know how to do that I know how to write a syllabus for college students and I wrote a syllabus as a Google Doc that I'm inviting high school teachers to to help me to make that more uh, appropriate for for high schools and you know and I think you know we have an issue in that many schools uh, don't allow internet access and in some some cases by law and that strikes me as just a, a extraordinarily dangerous as as well as um, as short-sighted you know we have a lot of parents are fearful about the internet what they should be fearful about is not having their kids learn you know how to tell the good information from the bad information so uh, one thing that I've 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 done is invited people if, if you want to uh, participate I can add you as an editor or, or as a commenter on that that document I added modules for the high school that were, weren't in the in the college syllabus on on remix and and what is sometimes called citizen a uh, digital citizenship and um, I got some pushback on that digital citizenship idea about not uh, you know it, it, it being sort of a a euphemism for uh, uh, teaching kids not not to uh, not to infringe on the on the big copyright owners whereas I you know I think it's you know if you're particularly if you're talking about uh, participation in our society much larger than that so that's my little pitch for it and anybody who's interested can email me howard at reingold.com and I would just say that this is something I'm definitely interested in, in bringing into CDAGs and so again like Howard if other people are interested in that I think that's a conversation I'm interested in beyond this also So I, I just wanted to pick up on, you know, one thing that um, Howard was touching upon and, and just to follow up on, you know, what I was saying earlier. I mean, I think to me the question is, you know, how do we build the case for, for instance, uh, you know, the use of, of, um, of uh, mobile devices in the classroom? How do we build the case for the fact that, you know, I mean, we're encountering in, in school districts that we work with, like, you know, I mean, there's certain policies that, you know, seem deeply misguided, like, you know, you're a Google Apps district, but you're not allowed to use YouTube as a resource. You know, I mean, so so how, so to me, the question, and I guess what I was trying to, you know, what I was groping for earlier <laughs> was this idea of, how, you know, how do we build the case, um, you know, and, and it seems to me like 
simply um, practice by practice examples, you know, is, is one way, but, it, you know, it's, it's really challenging. And I think the ability, you know, because I, I, when I'm on Twitter, you know, I see a lot of like-minded educators um, and, you know, there are some movements forward, I feel like, but there needs to be a way in which, you know, I think we can come together as, as interested actors with, um, you know, a similar mindset um, and, and, and figure out, you know, how we move forward um, together. So, so I think that's really what I was trying to say. You know, how do we build these cases so that we can uh, get beyond, you know, the kinds of um, situations like Howard was describing? Well, I, I just want to add before uh, we're finished here that very soon we're going to add uh, comment threads to the archives of these discussions so that maybe we can pursue questions like that a little bit further. We're beginning to build a little bit of a community here, and I, th I think that we shouldn't leave these questions hanging. Just I think the great advantage of having something like a comment thread is that the, the, the questions that were raised don't have to be dropped when we're, we're finished. So we've just got a few more seconds here. Does anybody want a last word? I just, I just want to thank everyone. But I also, you know, I, I think Paul's question is one that I have as, as well. And I think, you know, there, there's some spaces that are, are funding this type of work to, to continue this type of research. Um, and I tend to hear from districts and, and um, from the Department of Ed, there's interest in these spaces, but I think there's a disconnect in, in connecting these pieces together and shaping the teaching practice around this. And so I'm curious in you know, leveraging this work across these different types of worlds um, that are being communicated. So um, Paul, I appreciate your question. It's definitely one that I, I think about a lot. Thanks everybody. Um, I just wanted to add, I really wanna thank Antero for sort of bringing this up and also just the work you're doing to try to bring this work in a public school setting where you know you're probably receiving different amounts of welcome for what you're doing and um, but I think it's critical and important and so um, I just appreciate the conversation thanks well that's the end of our hour and we're trying to keep this to an hour thank you respondents it has been fa fantastic uh, a conversation thank you folks in the in the live stream as well we um, are still working on who we're going to have at this time next week so uh, if stay tuned to connectedlearning.tv or if you want to be on the on the mailing list you can do it from there and um, thank you folks we'll see you next week all right, thanks. thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye, Paul. Bye, everybody.